your hand. I was. Do you want to uh, call uh, the ones I wasn't sure how you wanted to handle? Do you want to call the names of people who raise their hands or do you just want me to do it? It's completely up to you. I mean, um, whoever you see raise their hand and you're free to call upon them. I'm seeing, sorry, it's, it's hard for me to, it's LA blue print. My, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to see. Go oh, ahead. In that oh. case, I can call them. I can I can ask my question if that's okay. Um, okay. I think I'm the one being called upon. Um, I was wondering, is there any set standard or policy that you guys recommend for any accidental exposures at club events? Um, I think first of all, um, it is it's I don't know about about your experience. It is almost daily now I would get an exposure, potential exposure notice. It is very frightening and it's disconcerting, disconcerting. But I think um, you know, things happen. I think we do the very best we can in terms of giving people guidance, making sure people just be considerate of one another, right? If you have events, you ask people to please, you know, if you're showing any symptoms, you're exposed to people who have symptoms or who are just tested positive, don't come. Um, because, you know, then it just it just makes things so much harder when, um, when then you have to then notify all the members and say, okay, you're, you know, potentially exposed. So, but it happens. There's absolutely no way around um, the alternative is we all go back to kind of isolation, do everything by Zoom. And I think we have heard and seen time and again, that's not what people want. People are really hungry and wanted to come back in person. So, um, you know, having said that, I think it's really just try to book a larger room. I always tell people, like, if you have, if you have, you know, uh, uh, expectation of 50 people showing up book a room that's meant for 100 people you really want to make sure you have room to spread out and if possible do it outdoor I mean we're very lucky to be in Southern California that we have nice weather most of the time compared to you know some of our uh, you know counterparts in other schools we have to deal with a lot of weather issue so right now we're still warm we're still you know uh, have quite a bit of sunshine, take it outside, really. I really encourage um, people to do so. If you're indoor, try to spread out as much as you can. And, you know, I still encourage people to always try to um, wear masks. You know, if they're even if they're outdoor, if they're like talking next to one another, you know, in large crowd. Um, but to your to your question, accidental, there is no policy, right? Because because anything we would tell you, if we say, okay, stop meeting, um, that's not good. That's not conducive to what you're trying to do. So I, I think if you're doing this for your group, I would say kind of take temperature of your group in terms of how do you think most people feel comfortable with. Um, if possible, offer hybrid uh, so that people don't feel like, oh, I'm going to miss out on something that you're organizing because I cannot go in person. So I, I think if you if it's possible to have some kind of hybrid component, that's still highly recommended. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that does. Thank you so much. Sure. And I see uh, Kara. Was it Kara? Yeah, it's Kara. Kara. So I was wondering about the um, like removal of the mandatory testing. Uh, I was wondering if there was any reason given for why that was done. Um, because as you mentioned, you've, you've been getting like lots of positive COVID exposure notices. I recently had COVID this summer. Like it's, it's certainly not going away. Yeah. And that was to me, one of the only things keeping people accountable because I had a completely asymptomatic COVID test. I would not have known unless I was required yeah. to test like for my work currently. Yeah. So I'm just kind of wondering why that is. And if there's any chance it will come back and like what the circumstances of that. Um, so that's not a decision that campus make lightly. I think it is really just um, how pervasive uh, COVID is, is just being around, just people sim have symptoms, no symptoms. And then as you know, once you get tested positive, even if you have a negative antigen test for 90 days or so, if you continue to test using the PCR test, you most likely will come back positive. So I think it's just a matter of um, people, I think, are just getting tired of getting positive tests or 
for whatever reason. So we're not enforcing it because county, you know, it, we're going by, it's not just the number of cases. I know they're like five point measure that they do. I'm gonna um, see if I can remember the, them all. Um, uh, it's it's basic, so it's actually eight, eight pivot points that there's taken into consideration uh, when they change increased protocols or, you know, uh, reduce protocols. Increased case alone is not going to lead to stricter re uh, measures. They also are going to consider an increase in case plus worsening of four of the following criteria. And they are breakthrough in hospitalization rates, uh, LA County ICU capacity, LA County death, UCLA vaccine rate, UCLA ICU isolation, bed availability, contact tracing capacity and workload, uh, test positivity rate. So I think the short answer to your question is because of the high vaccination rate in our community, it is um, considered, and with all these eight different point of factors, considered with county health, uh, uh, hospitals, record, and all that, it's a combination of all that factors, but most importantly, because of the high vaccination rate in our community that it is decided that um, the testing will no longer be mandatory. But again, we still highly encourage people to test. And it is free. We're very fortunate, right? Um, a lot of times people have, especially if they are uh, in a time crunch, have to go to an urgent care to get some tests. It's They have to worry about getting uh, insurance. And if it's expedited test, there is no coverage. So, so I think we're very fortunate. So if you can encourage people, continue to test. That's what I always tell people: go test. You know, we have we're so lucky to have these uh, tests made available to us. I hope that answers your question, Car. Yeah, it definitely answers it. But I guess it's just disappointing because I know I, I've like heard people lie on their symptoms monitoring survey. Um, like I've heard a lot of very suspicious coughs in class that would not be say allergy, like they, people just are not, this is the only thing I think, again, keeping people accountable that, from what I could see from my vantage point. So it's just, I, I know that there are checks and balances in place, like that, you know, trickle down from the county and get discussed. Um, but I think like every COVID protocol that UCLA carried out um, was done kind of too little too late. Um, and so I saw the effect of that with um, a lot of COVID exposures that um, would have been avoided uh, or like, uh, like we're definitely helped by the testing being mandatory. So, so I know so, that's not necessarily something you can no, I, I'm so glad you said that because we also hear very strong uh, opinions on the other side who feels that we're being too strict. You know, why are we still in, you know, there are places don't, they actually don't have mass mandate. So we're actually uh, in the university that believe that we should continue to wear, to your point, because a lot of times uh, people are, uh, Asymptomatic, asymptomatic, so they don't show any symptoms. So if they're not wearing masks and they get test positive, you know, my goodness, right? So um, I think, you know, we try to find that that balance. We're trying to understand where people are coming from, and I really encourage patience, compassion, consideration, because there are times when people cough. It's not because of COVID. They have, and I, I've also heard stories from people saying that they, they feel like they have to strain themselves not coughing because they're worried about being discriminated against or being kicked out of an event because they, they cough, maybe because just they just choke or they do have an allergy. So I just think that um, we always try to give people benefit of the doubt. You do the best you can, things that you can control, you try to do, and we try to encourage people um, to act responsibly. I have also heard people worry about people lying on the symptom monitoring. So I always encourage students, please don't do that, right? Because your faculty and your TAs are going to make accommodations. There's no need to lie uh, on the symptom monitoring survey uh, in order to make it to an event or make it to a class. You're not doing anybody any favors. So, um, Again, we, it's hard to be an administrator because we're trying to find that middle ground and trying to be more inclusive of everyone's opinion. All right, thank you. Uh, I see uh, Hannah. Hi, um, I had a question in particular about like external guests visiting campus for events. Yeah. Um, if we do decide to require them to take or like gain clearance or take the symptom monitoring survey, mm -hmm. um, are we requiring like proof of vaccination or um, like a negative COVID test or anything in order to pass that clearance? 
No, because symptom monitoring tests for uh, external guests, you, you have, if you tried it, right, you can just try to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. It just asks you for your symptoms. It doesn't ask you for your, it asks you what are the same questions you get asked, right? Have you okay. recently been uh, isolated? Have you te recently tested? But it does not ask you whether you have gotten vaccination, does not ask you whether you have proof of vaccination. And we are not requiring that. Um, yeah, so it, again, symptom monitoring is sort of just like your way of trying to encourage, right? If, you, if, if anyways, like trying to encourage those who are not feeling well to stay home, right? Um, it is absolutely something that we leave it to individual, but this may change. I just want to make that very clear. Right now we're August in the middle of summer. Um, when winter time comes, if situation changes, we may go back to make it, you know, mandatory for people to do uh, not only symptom monitoring, but also, uh, uh, you know, check a vaccine status. But right now that's not required. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, is it Zihao? Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned potential of, of like encouraging hybrid meetings for student orgs. Does UCLA have any support in place for helping or set up hybrid meetings uh, because I know a lot of potential like lab spaces and rooms don't really have audio or video equipment set up um, so is there any support from, from the school for that um so I have attended almost all the department town halls and when we do it and and I'm I'm not saying that you all go to mom and book it uh, because the monitorium is is pretty subscribed but I, I know that they are people just simply bringing a laptop so you have a Zoom meeting, right? You have a, a Zoom meeting where you have the laptop and you have people present. Uh, it's not ideal because sometimes you can't really see the people presenting, but you can actually have um, the audio and then you can have people ask live questions. In terms of the support, I, I'm afraid I don't. I know like lectures and, and you know, we have... Um, uh, right. brewing casting that's you know there I think 11 lecture halls and maybe some 50 some uh, classrooms have either the recording capacity just for audio or also for video but I don't know if that's allowed you know for anything that's not lecture uh, related so um, this is something that I encourage you uh, are you gonna talk to Wes uh, I'm sorry I wasn't sure if uh, so we have um uh, Wes uh, her who works with student groups. So I, I suggest you ask that question because I know he will probably know better in terms of support for hybrid. But I, even if you just like a lot of our student orgs, they're just so creative. They come here with the, just a, just some laptop and then I, I've seen them. I, I've attended town halls where it's hybrid, um, where you actually hear people, uh, you know, usually you put it in front of the presenter so they can see the presenter. Uh, and also they get to uh, they get to uh, have live questions asked, which is usually, um, uh, you know, if you don't have you don't have good uh, audio system, usually they can just type the question and then someone will ask it for you. So there are various ways of doing it. Right. I'm just curious about uh, from the school's perspective, but thank you so, so much. So I, I I encourage you to ask uh, Wes or her when you, uh, when you hear his presentation. Yes, Kyle. Hello, I know it's a little bit earlier for this, but I was just curious if there's been any information about like protocols for monkeypox. I know this is for COVID-19, but I was just curious. Um, so I, I don't know if you know, there was a brain post uh, that went out earlier uh, this week. I really encourage you, as, as, if you miss any brain post, um, I encourage you to go uh, to a uh, Bruin Safe or uh, an other website. If it's from from Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Office, it will be on their website too. Um, that there's a very long and detailed uh, protocol on monkey um, monkeypox, but I can read you what I have. I sort of capture. Um, uh, sort of like the essence of that post, which is UCLA is closely monitoring the spread of monkeypox in the Los Angeles area. As of right now, the university is working to develop isolation measures for those who get infected and is providing access to treatment and testing for monkeypox. UCLA, uh, uh, UCLA is also working with uh, LA, California uh, Department of Public Health 
to vaccinate those who are uh, high risk, including those who have uh, have had high risk contact with uh, inf infected individ individuals. Vaccine access currently is very extremely limited at this time. So if you are concerned, I would say go to Ash Center if you happen to be on campus. If not, go to whatever is most convenient to you, right? If you have, um, if you're on campus, go to Ash Center and see if you can um, uh, get some support there. Uh, if not, go to your uh, primary doctor. This is very new to everyone. You know, California and uh, uh, the entire country, there's not enough vaccine right now to go around. Um, so obviously, just like the beginning of COVID vaccine, when it first gets launched, is the most vulnerable people uh, is sort of, a high, of course, a high priority to get the vaccine. Obviously, I really encourage you um, to pay attention. And I, I think I'm going to do this. Uh, the next time when uh, monkeypox, um, when posts come out about, about monkeypox, I'm going to have a Q&A, um, short Q&A linked to our COVID page. Because uh, I know I, I know there are a lot of students now concerned about this uh, other, other issue. Thank you. Sure. And I just want to mention, um, first of all, I want to apologize. I did my recording so late at night after a long day at work. So I was like probably mumbling instead of making, if I'm not making sense, please ask me the question now and I'll try my best to uh, to clarify. Um, but I am part of the um, uh, campus leadership. So I meet very regularly on a weekly basis. So with my counterpart, UCLA Health. And we have a sort of a task force, like, you know, fast response to, uh, so so anytime when there's anything update from UCLA Health, I, I'm pretty much, I would know as soon as, um, you know, there's any decision in terms of change or anything like that. So I will then make sure that information gets put on that website, uh, that page uh, as quickly as possible. So please do check the, do check the page because we do change it. Um, whenever there's, you will see um, the the um, easiest way to see the first line was say the last time it was updated, right? So if you if you would just pay attention, if you go go to that page and if you notice that it has been recently updated, um, make sure you look it over. Does anyone have any more questions? If not, then Dean Lee, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us this evening. You're very welcome. I guess I'll see you back on Tuesday. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. All thank right. You. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, next up is Space Use. Hello, my name is Wesley Hara. I am the UCLA Samuel A. Engineering Trans uh, Transfer Center Director. I'm also the UCLA Engineering Student Organization Coordinator, which makes more sense as to why I'm presenting here today. Um, today, I'm here to talk a little bit about space use by student organizations, um, as well as what the application process is. I know that uh, some of you are interested in um, seeing if there is space within the school. Uh, where your organization may reside. Um, and so this will be helpful for you. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and begin. Um, I wanna just kind of give a brief overview about space use um, and the expectations of this. As student organization leaders are responsible for the safety of their membership while using their campus space, as well as the impact of their activities on the campus environment. And so, you know, along with the privileges of being able to use space within the school, it is the expectation that the student organization leaders are responsible for whoever uses that space and to make sure that your activities are not impacting um, the campus environment, okay? In addition, student organization leaders are responsible for understanding, upholding, and disseminating information on campus policy as it relates to your space and the activities that occur within them, okay? And so, um, our expectation is that our leaders are understanding what's expected to be able to occupy a space and keep people safe um, and that you're upholding those campus and school policies and disseminating that information 
um, you know, to the, your membership and the people that use your space. Okay, and effectively.